Praise the Lord, everyone, and welcome to Bethesda Temple School of Knowledge. We are poised to start a new series this evening. Uh, as we prepare our minds and our hearts, let us go before the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you. Thank you for our gathering together through this venue by way of Facebook Live. We are so grateful even for the blessing of this venue so that we can come together to learn of your word and to become all that you would have us to be. Now I pray your blessing upon those who are viewing or will be viewing at a later time. Quicken our minds, our hearts, and our spirits that we might receive your word. Quicken our wills that we might apply your word so that we can become all that you would have us to be. Bless us now as we confer together and we will certainly give you the praise, the glory, the honor that's due you. We ask these favors in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I'll be back in just a bit with the message, but right now, Minister Brian George is going to favor us with a selection. I will bless the Lord oh my that it has been given to others. In successive le lessons, we'll be talking about arising, about shining, and about God's glory being seen upon us. But for right now, what we should be taking away from Isaiah's words in these two verses is that it is time for us 
to take our rightful places as adult sons and daughters of God and to exert a positive influence on our world, or at least our part of the world. Now, there's a passage of scripture that I believe is descriptive of the impact that God's people should be making in their spheres of influence. If you'll turn with me to Acts chapter 17, beginning at verse 4, we'll read down through verse 7, and it reads, And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks, a great multitude, and of the chief women, not a few. But the Jews, which believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city on an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. And when they had found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also, whom Jason hath received, and these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. But I want you to notice in verse 6 how they refer to the people of God. These that have turned the world upside down. What a testimony from those who are enemies of the gospel. Um, that those who are carrying forth the truth and living the life of Christ out in their own lives are turning their world upside down. This is our goal so that we can make an impact on our world, on our sphere of influence, on our jobs, in our neighborhoods, in our communities, we want to make a positive impact for the cause of Christ. But in order to do it, we have to arise and shine. Now, Paul teaches us that there are basically three types of people, three types of individuals um, that you can find in the world today. These are broad categories, but they fit. First of all, there is the natural person. Uh, the word natural that Paul would use would be the Greek word psukikos, um, which really basically refers to the soulish person. This is the unsaved person who, whose highest form of life is dominated by his reason and by his emotional nature. Now, here is the problem with that. According to 1 Corinthians 2, 14, the natural man cannot receive the things of God. Notice how Paul put it, but the natural man receiveth not the things of God, of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. This is a dangerous place because not only does the natural man not receive the things of God, the things of the Spirit of God, but basically rebels against them and says that they are foolishness. And I'm sure that much of what the child of God believes is in fact foolish to the natural mind, to the natural instincts, that which we believe often sounds foolish. Now, there is another type of person, and that is the carnal person. The word that Paul uses when he refers to the carnal person is sarkinos. Sarkinos literally means fleshy or fleshly. The same man 
is uh, one who has not found deliverance from the power and the control of sin in the fullness of the spirit is what we would call a carnal person. So it is a saved person who is more or less under the control of his or her old nature. Paul says in Romans 7, 14, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. So the carnal person is one who remains sold under or in bondage to sin. Again, in Romans chapter 8, verse 7, Paul says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Now, you will, you may recall that on this past Sunday, as uh, we were, as I was ministering the word of God, I shared with you that God is looking for some friends. And although many say, I am a friend of God, just because you say it doesn't make it so. And here in Romans 8, Paul takes it a little further and says, if you have a carnal mind, it is at enmity with God. You, in fact, become an enemy of God. You are saved by him. You are his child, but you are an enemy. I guess we would call it today something like a frenemy. But you are not in the right relationship with God. Now, let me give you a passage of scripture that is descriptive of the carnal individual. If you'll turn to Hebrews chapter 5, beginning at verse number 9, and I pick 9 and 10 up simply for context uh, so that the rest of it will make sense. It says, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto them that obey him. Of course, the writer is speaking of Christ, called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing, spiritually dull. This is part of the description of a carnal person. They are spiritually dull. Paul goes on, or the writer of Hebrews goes on to say, for when for the time you ought to be teachers, for as long as you have been in Christ, you ought to be teachers. You have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. You should be teachers, but you need to be taught the basics and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. Now I want you to see something. The writer says, and are become. So it indicates that it is the there is a great possibility that they were not always that way, but have drifted backward and now have become such as need milk and cannot handle meat. But strong meat belong to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. But if our senses are not exercised, then they atrophy. And if our senses atrophy, then we are not going to be able to discern the difference between good and evil. And I think that this is where uh, we find a lot of ambivalence in the Church of God today. Um, as to what is right and what is not right, uh, uh, where we find relativism in the church of God today because our senses have not been exercised to discern good and evil. But there comes a time when God expects us to know of a certainty the difference between 
good and evil. The difference between black and white and not a mixing of black and white so that we find ourselves in gray areas. Right. Now there is a third person and this is the goal that we should be striving for. And this is the spiritual person. We've talked about the natural person uh, who is not saved at all. We talked about the carnal person who is saved but uh, does not function as a child of God should function. And finally, we come to the third category of persons, and that is the spiritual person. When Paul refers to the spiritual person, he calls them pneumatikos, spirit person. The believer who is a spiritual person is one who is living his or her life in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Paul uh, sort of identifies this spirit person, this spiritual person, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14 through 16, where he says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things. Now notice, 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 please notice. It says judges all things, not judges all people. Uh, there's a very important difference there. But he that is spiritual judges all things or discerns all things, um, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? that he may instruct him. But we, that is, those who are spiritual, have the mind of Christ. Now, in uh, 1 Corinthians 3, verse number 1, Paul puts the two together, the carnal man and the spiritual man, and says this, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. And it is um, a sad fact that you can be in Christ for years, decades, and remain a babe in Christ. If you refuse to yield to the Spirit of God, but continue to yield to your carnal mind, you remain a babe in Christ and you can digest the meat of the word. You stay on milk. And so uh, I pray God that that will not be the lot of anybody who is a part of our fellowship, that we remain on milk when we should be eating strong meat because we are able to handle it. But let's consider what a saint should look like. Let's consider what a saint really should be. God has called us to be victorious and to do more than struggle with life in Christ. Now, he has never told us that we are going to be carried to the sky on flowery beds of ease. As a matter of fact, Jesus said that uh, if he were persecuted, you should expect to be persecuted. Paul said, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So it's not always going to be easy, but we can always be victorious. Consider what the Apostle John said in his first epistle. In 1 John chapter number 5, uh, verses 4 and 5, John makes a definitive statement where the believer is concerned. He said, whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. So John says to us, 
if you are born of God, you have the potential for victory. And as we grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and in the knowledge of the Word of God, we continue on victoriously. Now, remember also what Paul said of us in the 8th chapter of the book of Romans. And we may be wearing that 8th chapter out, that 8th chapter out before the end of this series because it uh, speaks to us of rising up and becoming all that God would have us to be. But I want you to uh, hone your attention in on one particular passage of Scripture, and that is verses 35 through 37, where Paul says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. Now he must be talking to someone who is on their way to victory because uh, for many of the people of God, tribulation would separate them from Christ. Distress would separate them from Christ. Persecution would cause them to leave Christ altogether. So he's speaking of someone else, those who are striving in Christ. And he says in verse 36, as it is written, but I say, we are killed all the day long. And I love this part here. It says, we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Notice what he said. We are accounted as sheep for the, the slaughter. This is what the adversary thinks of us. We are sheep for the slaughter. This is what the enemy thinks of us. We are sheep for the slaughter. But Paul goes on to say in Romans 8, 37, nay or no. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. We're more than conquerors in tribulation. We are more than conquerors in distress. We're more than conquerors in persecution, in famine, nakedness, peril, or sword. We overcome all of them because Christ overcomes them for us and with us. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. This is what and how we are called to be as the people of God. Victorious, conquerors, always overcoming. But this is often how the saints of God look, moving on. While uh, victorious is how we should look and how we should be, while conquerors are how we should be, how this should be among us, sadly, many of God's children find it a struggle just to stay safe. It's rough just staying safe. Many find difficulty in simply or simple day-to-day -day living in Christ. Uh, let me share something with you. The devil's not going to allow it to be easy for you every day. The adversary is going to throw some things your way. Not only will the adversary throw them some things your way, but life itself, the world, will throw some things your way. And as quiet as it's kept, you got stuff in you that will rise up. But there comes a time when we have to grow past all of these things. It's easy to live saved when it's easy to live saved. Did you get that? Amen. I'll say it one more time. It's easy to live saved when it's easy to live saved. But there are times when your salvation and your spirituality are challenged. Uh, a long time ago, we used to say it like this, you know, will you keep the victory or did you lose the victory? So many still talk about losing the victory, but we should be talking about gaining and maintaining the victory. There is no such thing, dear hearts, as victory without struggle. There is no such thing as victory without a fight. 
So if you are in a fight, you should consider yourselves on your way to victory and not getting ready to throw in the towel. The picture that John and Paul painted in the scriptures that I just shared with you are what we should be striving to become. I would like to paint a picture of where many of the children of God find themselves presently. And I warn you, it's not a pretty picture, but I have to share it with you. Because I believe this, I believe that many of the people of God suffer from an identity crisis. We don't really know who we are, and we don't really believe whose we are. We'll talk about that in future lessons. But because we suffer from an identity crisis, Paul shared a startling thing with us in Romans chapter 7. A startling look at the carnal child of God. Paul says in verse 14, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. Now, Paul was not confessing there, Paul was teaching. You need to understand, Paul was really not talking about himself. Paul was speaking as a carnal Christian. Paul says, for that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that I do, or that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Now before you use that as an excuse, in verse 17, what Paul is saying, that sin nature that should have been dealt with when you got saved has risen up in you. Now both Paul goes on to say, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that sin nature that dwelleth in me. I find in a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Or the death in this body, the death that should not be in this body, who shall deliver me from it? That is an interesting turn of phrase in verse 24. I want to read it again. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? There are many who believe that Paul alluded to a custom there that was practiced by ancient tyrants. Virgil, the poet, gave an account of the tyrant Mezentius, Mezentius who employed the exercise of binding a dead body to a living person as a punishment and compelling him to drag that cumbersome and offensive burden wherever he went. So the dead body was literally tied to the person, legs to legs, torso to torso, arms to arms, and face to face. And that person would have to lug that dead body around until the contagion 
from the decaying mass that he was carrying would literally come upon him and eat him alive. He would experience decomposition while he was living until it literally stole his life. Mm. Now, uh, I was watching Deacon Williams as I was describing that punishment and how vile it was and I saw him wince and I saw him shake his head as he thought about being chained to a dead person, leg to leg, arm to arm, torso to torso, face to face, so that that dead person's face is right in your face. And uh, it is a horrifying thought. But let me give you a thought that's almost as horrifying. This is what so many of us do. We are bound to the old man. And we drag the old man around, not realizing that we can unshackle ourselves from the old man who is dead. And if we keep carrying the old man around, if we remain bound to the old man, then the same putrid mass that is a part of the old man will become us. Mm. Now, Let's get serious here. The problem, I think, is not because we want to be carnal. I don't think we want to live carnal lives. This is why we came out of the world. I think our problem, or many people's problems in Christ, stem from ignorance. We just don't know certain things. There are those who yield to generational predilections or as many pop theologians and folk in the spirit call it generational curses and I won't argue as to whether or not there are generational curses let me say this if you believe that they are that there are generational curses you have already opened yourself to those general generational curses. If you don't, you may not be aware of what is in your family line. So either way, it's kind of a dangerous thing. But here is what frees you from generational predilections. Second Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are passed or are become new. So then the generational curses which may have afflicted your family are passed away. And that passed away is an interesting phrase. In the Greek it is parerkome, which means to perish to avert, to sidestep. So you have sidestepped your past. It is perished. And you know what? Dead things, passed away things need to be buried and left right where they're buried. I don't know of many people who bury a loved one, then go back, dig that loved one up, and take them back to their homes. I don't know many people who do. And if they do, there are those who are going to think that there is something very wrong with that person. What I'm saying is what is passed away, what is dead should be left for dead. What is in your past should be left in your past. Do not allow your past to pinion you and keep you from your future. Amen. Don't allow what happened and who you were to bind you from whom you are to become. Now let me continue on. Some yield to old desires. If we are not careful and we leave certain doors open, then certain desires will rise up in us. Paul said in Romans 6, 16, Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves, servants to obey, 
His servants are ye to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. So if you leave yourself open for sin, it will have rule over you. And then there are those who simply do not know or do not realize that they are already free. So if you are bound to something, if you are struggling with something from your pre-Christ days, from before you came to Christ, but you're still struggling with those same issues, let me help you out a little bit. Turn with me to Romans chapter number six, beginning at verse number three, Paul says, know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ, like as Christ was, raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Listen, y'all. Verse 7 says, for he that is dead is free from sin. You are free. We are dead to things. We are dead to things. There are certain things that a corpse will not do. You can offer a corpse a drink, but they will not take it, even if they were alcoholics before they died. You can offer them a cigarette. You can offer them a cigar. You can offer them a blunt. You can offer them a crack pipe. They will not take it. They are dead to those things. You can uh, devise a plan to knock over a bank that is flawless and take it to a bank robber who is dead and they will not join you. Why? Because they are dead to that. Now, all of this may sound silly, but what I'm saying is once you're dead to something, you're dead to something. The only way it can come back is if you resurrect it. If you resurrect it, because understand, death is not necessarily annihilation. It is simply separation. You resurrect it when you go back to it. But if you don't, God has given you the power by the Holy Ghost to say no to those things. Let me show you what we really need to know. The cure for ignorance is knowledge and understanding. So let me show you what we really need to know in order to move from Romans chapter 7 to Romans chapter 8. To move from that struggling person that Paul dealt with to becoming the adult sons and daughters of God. In Romans chapter 7, beginning at verse number 1, Paul says, Know you not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth or is alive. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. Now, y'all, before we go any further, Paul is not talking about marriage and divorce here. He is using this as an example. And if you get stuck on that here, you're going to miss what Paul says. Paul says in verse 3, so then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Here's the point. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that 
we should bring forth fruit unto God. Now, I want to read that from the New Living Translation because I think it really nails it home. Paul says, now, dear brothers and sisters, you who are familiar with the law, don't you know that the law applies only while a person is living? For example, when a woman marries, the law binds her to her husband as long as he is alive. But if he dies, the laws of marriage no longer apply to her. So while her husband is alive, she would be committing adultery if she married another man. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law and does not commit adultery when she remarries. So, my dear brothers and sisters, this, this is the point. You die to the power of the law. And let me add something. You die to the power of sin when you die with Christ. And now you are united with the one who was raised from the dead. As a result, we can produce a harvest of good deeds for God. And that is our goal, to produce a harvest of good deeds for God. That's what it's all about. God has been so good to us that the least we can do is bear fruit. The least we can do is bring forth the kind of fruit that he has designed for us to bring forth. So let's talk about what it remains for us to do. Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verse number two, I don't want to deal with verse number one right now. I want to deal with verse number two. Because if verse number two is properly addressed, we don't have to address verse number one. It becomes natural. But Romans 12 and 2 says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your minds, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, y'all, I have to give you uh, Kenneth S. Weiss expanded translation of Romans 12 and 2 and then I'm going to explain a little bit of what Weiss uh, was saying and Weiss was a Greek scholar. We said and stop assuming an outward expression that does not come from within you and is not representative or is no longer representative of what you are in your inner being, but is patterned after this age. But change your outward expression to one that comes from within and is representative of your inner being by the renewing of your mind, resulting in your putting to the test the will of God the good and well-pleasing and complete will. And having found that it needs specifications, place your approval upon it. I want you to see something where Paul says, and be not conformed to this world. Um, Kenneth Weiss gives us an understanding of the grammar that Paul actually used from the Greek, and where you see be not conformed, Kenneth Weiss is telling us to stop being conformed. It is the command to stop an action, to cease an action that is already occurring. So Paul was saying you're conforming yourselves to the world. But remember, you were saved out of the world. You were delivered from the world. So stop conforming yourselves to the world. You are taking on an outward expression that does not come from the new man. Can I say it like this? You cannot be spiritual and stay what you were. So he's saying, Paul is saying, stop trying to be what you no longer are and stop acting out of your old mindset. Remember that you have changed. 
that you have changed and act from your new nature rather than from the way that you used to be. You cannot be spiritual and stay what you were. You can be carnal and remain what you used to be. But you have to remember, the carnal man is an enemy of God. He is against God because he is pulling in the opposite direction. Our goal in this series as we rise up is to become spiritual men and women. Men and women who are guided, directed, unctioned, and moved by the Holy Spirit. So over the next few weeks, we are going to examine issues that will help us to understand at least three things. Now, it may not be limited to these three, but we are going to be dealing with these three things. Who we are in Christ, whose we are in Christ, and what we should be doing now that we are in Christ. The goals of this series are that we rise up and that we take our rightful place among the victorious and the overcomers and that we make the impact that God has called us to make before the foundation of the world. You know, his plan for your life goes back a lot further than the day that you came to Christ. But now it is time for us to rise up and become what God has called us to be so that we can do what God has called us to do. But Brian is going to give us a song and then I will be back to answer your questions if you have any. Take it, Brother Brian. Rise, How can he be how, how can, can he, he be saved? Well, he is saved because he has embraced um, 
the message of Christ and has embraced the salvation of Christ, but he is not behaving as a son. He is not behaving as if he were related to Christ. He is not fully owning God, but God has fully owned him. Now, what we have to be careful of is uh, judging the carnal person because we don't know what God will do in their lives and ultimately through them. But because, just as I preached a few weeks ago, uh, because the clay is marred in the hands of the potter is not that big a deal to the potter because he knows how to mold the clay into the way he wants it to be. So uh, he is saved, he is carnal, and not living in the fullness of the spirit. But you see, carnality uh, goes beyond, I think sometimes our very parochial views of what being carnal is. Anytime we are not in agreement with God, we are in effect carnal. So I hope that answers your question. And that's it? I don't see any more, but I have a question. Yes, sir. Um, I need some clarification. Because when you were talking about um, the law, yes. and I know we are of the covenant. We're, 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 we're not under the law. We're dead to the law. Is that correct? Right. So. I guess my question is, if we're dead to the law, do we still have to abide by the law? We have a higher law. Uh, Christ is the fulfillment of the law. Everything that was in the law was fulfilled in Christ. If we are servants of Christ, we serve him as he served under the law. We, we, we go further than the law has gone. Where um, ancient Israel strived, strove to fulfill the letter of the law, it is our goal in serving Christ and in being pleasing to him to fulfill the spirit of the law. So we go further. And I think with that being said, um, we're just going to Get ready to bid you a good evening. We're going to pray. And remember, we do have parking lot service. Praise and worship this coming Sunday. The Lord tarry. Be our helper at 11 a.m. The parking lot will open at 1030. Also at 1 p.m. If you have responded, and I think you may still have a little while yet today to respond to P, P, and E. Pray, part, pray, and eat. If you are RSVP, your meal will be free. Um, yes, G. I, I see another, another question. question. Okay. It's from First Lady. She says, can a cardinal person make heaven? Yes. Yes. Carnal person is going to make heaven. God does not divorce himself from his own. But, um, there are things that he will not experience in heaven. There are rewards that he cannot receive in heaven if he is not a spiritual being. Consider this. Even though Absalom warred against his father, took his father's throne, took his father's kingdom, and in the midst of all of that, lost his life. David never disowned Absalom as his son. In fact, mourned over him much more than David's general felt that he should have. God calls to himself his own, but there are consequences for carnality, both here and in heaven. 
All right, let us pray. Father, thank you for your kindness and your goodness. We bless you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for your precious word. I ask that you would help us to hide it in our hearts, that we sin not against you, but that we might become all that you would have us to be. Help us to arise, knowing that our light has come. Help us to shine so that we may give that light to others. Help us to be overcomers and more than conquerors so that we can help one another to be victorious in this life and in the next. We ask these favors in the precious name of Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. We look forward to seeing you on Sunday. And until next time, dear hearts, keep looking up.